Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Poverbin. My guest today is Rabbi Dr. Shlomo Brody. He's the executive director of Amitai and the Jewish Law Live columnist for the Jerusalem Post. He previously served as the founding director of the Tikva Overseas Student Institute and co-dean of Tikva Online Academy, a senior instructor at Yeshivat HaKotel, and as a junior research fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute. Rabbi Brody's career has focused on making Jewish texts accessible to broader audiences while applying them to contemporary social and ethical dilemmas. His writings have been cited in Israeli Supreme Court decisions and have appeared in Mosaic, First Things, Tradition, The Federalist, Tablet, Sohar, The Forward, Hakira, Jewish Review of Books, and other popular publications. His first book, A Guide to the Complex, Contemporary Halachic Debates, received a National Jewish Book Award. His latest book could not be more prescient or timely. Just published in both English and Hebrew, the title is Ethics of Our Fighters, A Jewish View on War and Morality. Welcome to the broadcast, Dr. Brody. It's so great to be with you. Thank you so much. So this book, when you began it, uh, I know it's very long. It's very, it has great depth and research. You couldn't have imagined that it would be as prescient and as needed as I think it does now. Can you just tell us what was the gestation for it and how are you seeing it resonate post-October 7th? Uh, there's no doubt I couldn't have imagined how relevant it would become. I've had a few people even say to me, like, wow, you wrote this whole book since October 8th. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but, you know, I've been working on this issue for some years. Uh, Tell I us what I'm the always... issue is, because the title doesn't necessarily explain it. Yeah, so the book is The Ethics of Our Fighters, and it's trying to present a Jewish take on military ethics, uh, which has, of course, been a really relevant issue since the founding of the State of Israel, even a little bit before. But it's particularly acute today when there's so much confusion about what it means to fight a just war. And uh, those of us who live in Israel understand very well the necessity of war sometimes, the necessity for defense, but we have to face really acute uh, questions. And I wanted to ask myself, uh, starting just for myself even, but then of course to share with others, with Israelis, with Jews, with non-Jews, whoever it might be, what Judaism might have to say about this topic. We usually think of Judaism teaching things like ethics of our fathers, right? These ideas of pithy, you know, w words of wisdom that the Talmudic rabbis have vote. the Pirkei Avot in Hebrew, exactly. But we haven't had that to say that much about the, the issues of fighting wars because we didn't do it for many centuries. And so now I really want to well, say... I want to well, just pause on that for a second. It, it kind of was a revelation, as simple as it may seem, when you say we didn't have an army <laughs> for thousands of years. I mean, you, you sort of don't you think about sort of biblical wars and you, I kind of assume there were armies... So when, what do you actually mean by that? When would you actually date our first army? Well, we, we definitely had armies or we, you know, certainly trace ourselves back into the biblical times and a little bit beyond when Jews had armies and the kingdom of David and Solomon and others. But, you know, since the destruction of the temple period, uh, certainly after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, the failed Bar Kokhba rebellion in the second century CE, we just haven't been fighting wars as Jews. And for that matter, even, you know, in within as minorities within broader countries that we lived in, Jews weren't allowed in many countries to fight. They weren't trusted as soldiers. And so really only in the 18th century, there are some exceptions in the medieval time period, but only in the 18th century, and particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, did Jews start to fight again uh, in any army, let alone a Jewish army. And so, you know, in terms of actually having questions that come up that we think about, that our thinkers think about, that our leaders think about. It just wasn't being brought up for many centuries. And as of 1948, how do you see that really change? Well, I mean, it changed a little bit beforehand, of course, because Jews are fighting in armies, in American armies, and the British armies. But when it gets to Israel, uh, the question then becomes of, on the one hand, we see an opportunity and a blessing that we're no longer powerless. Right. The fact that we can defend ourselves is of great, great importance. And not just on a strategic level, but on a moral level. Meaning it's a moral failure if you can't defend yourselves and your own people. But with power, of course, comes responsibility and obligations. 
And for the first time in many, many centuries, Jews have to think about what does it mean to fight as a Jew? And so Israel, which has faced warfare since the beginning, uh, and very difficult warfare, sometimes with enemies that don't think too broadly about the ethics of war, uh, we have to think for ourselves, well, what does it mean? What can we do to fight well, to succeed in our battles, but also be able to look ourselves in the mirror afterwards? The idea, though, that we're held to a different standard because we're Jews, as opposed to any other nation, can you help us a little bit with that? Because that's very animated in this moment, and we're talking during the Gaza War of 2024. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of this idea that we should be held to different standards. And that on a moral level, the whole idea of morality is that it should apply to everyone. Right? So uh, there's a moral imperative that applies to Jews, non-Jews. It applies to, should apply to Hamas. It should apply to the IDF, to the Ukrainians, to the Russians, whoever it might be. And there's no doubt that in the uh, world's eyes, for various reasons, I think we're being judged with the really... Uh, very carefully, sort of the mic microscope here and under the gun in a lot, multiple ways on this issue. And because of that, you know, on a strategic and diplomatic level, of course, we have to think carefully about how we behave. But we also need to just build up our moral fortitude because at the end of the day, there are many people that are judging us unfairly. And I think we feel that. But at the same time, that's not an excuse to say, OK, just because people are judging us unfairly means that we don't have to think about the morality of our actions. And so we really need to think deeply about what is exactly that we believe on these issues. And part of the purpose of the book is to say we as Jews who are part of the Jewish tradition who are deeply part of the Western intellectual tradition as well can integrate these worlds of wisdom and develop a way of thinking and a framework of thinking of these dilemmas. I wanted to just go back to when you said you were uncomfortable with this idea that Jews should be held to a higher standard. Um, there are many in, our, in my community and yours who are saying, I'm not comfortable with the loss of Palestinian life, even though this war is just. And they don't necessarily know what to do about that discomfort in terms of what they would prescribe or recommend, not that anyone's asking them. Um, in terms of what the how the IDF should conduct itself, what Israeli policy should be. But for those who are wrestling with this idea of wanting essentially to be able to kind of look themselves in the mirror while there is a great loss of life, how did your research and your kind of unpacking of how our history tells us to approach the moral questions, how is that informing you now? Yeah, I think Judaism sets up a framework of different variables, of different types of values that we always need to keep in mind. And the discomfort that people are feeling is not a bad thing. Israelis are feeling this as well, Jews around the world. I mean, it's horrible to see many non-combatants, including children at times, right, who are dying from this warfare. We don't want to be doing that. We don't want to see that happening. I mean, it's a terrible thing. And it's part, largely, I think, because we have a value of recognizing that all humans are created in the image of God, that humans are embedded with inherent dignity, and we don't want to see anyone dying, right? We don't want to have warfare. And so I, I think that that's a healthy initial reaction to have. And when done properly, I think that's a very good thing to have. Uh, at the same time, we also have to recognize the fact that there are other moral values that come to the table, that come to the equation, including the priority of defending our people, and defending those that we have primary responsibility for, for our family members, for our, our citizens, for our soldiers, uh, that's a moral imperative. And we have a real clear and present danger on our border, uh, certainly in Gaza, but also in Lebanon, of course, and in Iran, and we live in a very complex neighborhood, as they say. And there's a moral imperative to fight here and to destroy that threat that is really a dangerous one. And I think you know, in the past, people might have thought maybe it's not such a grave threat. And now we see it really is a grave threat. And so what you're going to have to do then is to try to create a framework where you balance these values on the one hand of defending yourself, uh, but trying to minimize as much as possible the amount of unnecessary collateral damage or harm to others that you don't want to have happen. And uh, this is a really difficult situation because in this case of asymmetric warfare, we're not only fighting against a terrorist group within an urban setting, but they're literally underneath their own citizens. Um, so they're really using them as human shields. 
Shlomo, I, I just want to make sure we all understand what you mean by asymmetrical warfare. Can you define it? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, what I have in mind here is a scenario in which we are fighting with a proper army, with men and women in uniform, you're clearly designating who are the soldiers and who are the non-combatants. On the Hamas side, you're finding a situation where it's sort of a guerrilla warfare tactics. They're not necessarily fighting within uniforms, and they're fighting amongst civilians. And so they're purposely blurring the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. The whole point of military ethics, of international law, is to try to minimize the amount of non-combatant damage, right? of non-combatant harm, of harm to civilians. When Hamas is purposely blurring the distinction between combatants and non-combatants, it creates a very difficult situation for you to try and defend yourself in those circumstances. And I think we just have to keep on reminding ourselves that the responsibility for many of these deaths lies with Hamas and the fact that they're not protecting their own people. Can you talk about uh, the term proportionality? It's also being discussed a lot. And very often it, there's a comparison of 1,200 were lost, um, murdered on October 7th, and now 30,000, you know, whatever is the number of today that is has come out of the health ministry in Gaza, and that that essentially is disproportionate. Just in terms of your book and how, again, you apply the principles of our tradition and also of our ethical teachings and what the IDF, I think, actually um, holds to when it approaches um, war strategy. Yeah, proportionality is a very misunderstood term. Uh, what it means in the legal level and the ethical level, the way it's properly spoken about, is that you always have to weigh is the perceived military advantage of a given act, of going to war and particular acts within war. Is it sufficient enough advantage gained to uh, justify it in spite of the inevitable collateral damage, the harm that's going to be done to non-combatants. So a classic example that they use in military law books, which isn't particularly helpful, but makes a point, which is that if you have a fighter on leave and it goes into a village, you don't destroy the whole village to just kill one you know, measly fighter. Right? That would be disproportionate type of attack. What Israel is trying to do, and what America does, and what Britain does, and the Western world, which has accepted this idea of proportionality, is to always ask when they do a given strike, when they do a different invasion, when you do a certain tactic, are the perceived or the attempted military advantages going to gain? Is it worth it given the fact that you might also harm a lot of non-combatants? And we see very vivid images of this from the IDF, from the fighter pilots, from drones, well, they'll cancel a strike because they want to kill a fighter, but he's being surrounded by 10 kids or something like that. So the perception is that is disproportionate. Now, if it was, was the head of Hamas in this moment, if it was someone who was about to launch a very you know, a strong bomb that we were missile, whatever it might be, that we were afraid was going to cause real damage to us, you might say it's proportionate to save your people in that circumstance. But we're trying to avoid those circumstances as much as possible. So the sum total of 30,000 isn't really indicative of proportionality because proportionality is all about, in given circumstances, can we say that we have attacked a given target because we think that's justified, even though we know there's going to be some damage? And I think it's important to keep in mind here, when you think about proportionality, we think that there are about 13,000 Hamas fighters that have been killed amongst these 30,000. It's perceived also that about one or 2,000 of the Gazans killed is tragically from Hamas fire, from missiles that land within Gaza, wherever it might be. If that's the case, we're talking about a one-to-one -one ratio or something like that. Now, again, it's tragic. It's really sad that 15,000 non-combatants have died. Don't, don't get me wrong. We should always remember that. But keep in mind that the Israeli record here is almost unprecedented for how low of a rate of non-combatant casualties we have. It's certainly much lower than Americans had or British had in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. I think we should take a lot of pride in yeah, that. I can, I can just hear, Shlomo, I can hear people saying, have you looked at these pictures? Have you seen the suffering? You talked about, what, was it uh, fighting a CNN war uh, or the CNN effect? Uh, we're losing that war and no. It's it's hard to justify and rationalize, even with a sense of 
of the justness of this war. Uh, so I just want to push you because I can imagine some thinking it's just too much. It's kind of what Biden said. It's over the top. I mean, this we're talking at a time when you, you can see sort of a public opinion, even from some of our friends, uh, is yeah. hardening against Israel. So I just want you to help us here. No, absolutely. No, I get that. But I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to the friends like Trudeau in Canada or Biden, Biden's been wonderful on many different levels. I have much respect and you know, thanks to President Biden for his support. But statements like that's over the top it is not a, a form of moral judgment. It's a knee-jerk reaction, a natural emotional reaction to seeing horrible pictures. But it doesn't explain those pictures why we're doing what we're doing. We are under a real attack right now. And if we weren't fighting this way, we would continue to be under attack. And so I think Israelis feel uh, that despite the fact that these pictures are horrible, we have our own horrible pictures to share as well. But that's besides the point, right? In other words, we're trying to solve this threat. And as soon as Hamas says, okay, we'll release the hostages, as soon as they say they'll stop fighting, I think Israelis would just stop. And this could all could be over today. And, and, and I think it's something you we just actually have to keep draw our the mind distinction. Thank you. you. You draw the distinction between excessive death and extensive death. Um, can you just say something more about that? Yeah, um, that's a, also a legal concept in international law, which regard to proportionality says that we understand that sometimes there'll be extensive deaths when the fighters are fighting amidst uh, civilians as Hamas is. When they're placing themselves in military targets, Amongst their own people, there's going to be extensive casualties. But that doesn't mean it's excessive given the nature of the warfare and given the nature of, uh, of the threat that we're trying to take care of. And so if we have to drop a bomb or a missile on a target, but that target has been purposely placed amongst their own civilians who they're using as human shields, then the responsibility for those deaths relies, lies with Hamas. And again, you know, I, I think we have to understand, though, that this is something that anyone who actually fights wars will appreciate. And so I, it's interesting. You're not seeing this type of critique from the military leaders from America or Britain or other places who have fought wars and know what it means to fight terrorists and urban warfare. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate that for political and other reasons, some of our you know, political leaders and friends I've been a little bit uh, critical of Israel, which I, I think is a bit unfair. But we have to do as much as Barat explaining this as we can. And we can show our picture as much as possible. By the end of the day, we are fighting a really uphill battle. And therefore, we have to just make sure at least we can justify it to ourselves why it is that we are fighting and how we're fighting. I, I was really fascinated when you kind of unpacked the Talmud's teachings on this, and particularly the imperative that when you see just city, you should leave an evacuation corridor so that civilians can be spared. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's a really fascinating Talmudic rule, which is codified by medieval philosophers and thinkers as well, which says that a siege, you want to leave an evacuation corridor, what they call the fourth side open, in order for humanitarian reasons to let people flee for their lives. And it's also seen as having a strategic advantage, because if you tell people, listen, we're not interested in killing you. Right? We have a certain military goal here, but you can get out of this. Then people will say, well, why should I fight to the end? Right? I would actually prefer to just flee for my life. And Israel has actually utilized this strategy uh, since 1982, uh, when Israel had a siege on the city of Beirut, capital city of Beirut, in the first Lebanon war. And the Ashkenazic chief rabbi of Israel, actually, Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, who has a real military history, is famous for blowing the shofar of the Western Wall in 1967, publicly proclaims he thinks that the IDF needs to create an evacuation corridor. And the IDF does that, actually. Not because Rabbi Gordon said it. I mean, they did it for their own principles and reasons. And 100,000 people flee Beirut, including, by the way, some of the terrorists that we were trying to kill. But Rabbi Gordon saw this as a great Kiddush Hashem, as sanctifying the name of God and the Jewish people, uh, because we were, while in the midst of fighting a war against real vowed enemies, we also didn't lose sight of the humanitarian factor as well. What about the, the again, another Talmud, Talmudic teaching, if you are told at gunpoint to murder someone innocent or to be killed, you must be killed rather than violate the prohibition of murder. 
So there's no doubt we don't want to do any form of illicit murder. I mean, that illicit killing is something that we don't believe in, and we'd rather kill than um, you know murder someone in an unethical way. A warfare, however, has always been understood to operate a little bit differently. And now that we should target, of course, someone who's innocent, we never target non-combatants. We never target innocent people. But uh, it is understood that because of the collective nature of warfare, even when we target the combatants, some non-combatants are going to be harmed as well. And so that principle, which you mentioned beforehand, is, of course, still relevant. And once someone stops being a threat, the threat's been neutralized, we won't shoot, we shouldn't shoot. Uh, but uh, at times, because of the nature of how war is fought, some people are gonna be harmed as well. That's tragic, uh, but it's justified on a moral level. But it doesn't mean that we should take this loss of light lightly. And, and that's again, part of the framework that we're trying to balance here. We've got really deep and really important values which we all understand to be true. And the question becomes is how do you apply them in these complex circumstances? So Dr. Bodhi, you, you've seen, I'm sure, that there is a lot of doubt in the world, particularly among the Jewish world, that the IDF is actually living by these values you describe. They, they just don't believe it. And I, I think that that's personally difficult is to think, how do we prove it? You know, how do you, in a sense, they, they may see that there's flyers being dropped, this proverbial knock on the, on the roof, um, giving time for people to evacuate the fourth wall. But I guess I would love you to say, is there some way for people to actually see what the IDF, what the IDF conversations are like or what their policies of, of war or training actually insist upon? Or is that something you just have to kind of take their word for? Well, Israel's a small country, so you don't have to take the word from anyone in this place. And, uh, I mean, we can, of course, show people our ethics books and the way the curriculum that we teach soldiers about how to fight. But you can also speak to soldiers. I mean, it's a small country. And, you know, in my neighborhood alone, we have many, many, many hundreds of soldiers, in fact. And you speak to them and ask them, what are they doing there? And they're really thinking about these issues. And they'll tell stories of times when they shoot or don't shoot and the questions and dilemmas that they faced. And, you know, at times, by the way, we suffer because we're very careful. And you know, I've had you know, students and neighbors who tell me stories where they choose not to shoot because they think it's a non-combatant. It turns out to be a scout for Hamas that's being disguised and uh, suddenly they have a, you know, a, some, a rocket being shot at them. So we've got a lot of people who are grappling with these issues on the ground uh, and also in the command. And I think that's to the great credit of the Israeli people. And, I know I think it's important for people to try to look for those stories. I mean, to go beyond the CNN highlights and, and you know, listen to what the IDF spokespeople are describing in the videos they share. I'm not telling you to follow that blindly. Of course, you know, we live in a democracy and democracies, you be critical and you should be critical of your leaders. But but listen to what they're describing. And I think people will appreciate that a lot better. You said that uh, Masada should not be a model. And I'd love to, to know why. It's kind of, it is one of the stopping points for any of our tour groups. Um, and sometimes we don't think about it in terms of kind of a, milita a military paradigm. Yeah, Masada became this great uh, spot where people go to visit and where Israel brings its IDF soldiers to for induction services. And it became this symbol in many ways of heroism but I don't buy it. I mean, the notion of mass suicide where the Jews commit in the first century CE instead of being taken capture, instead of surrendering, I don't think that's the model we want to have. Right? We don't want to have a model where our military fight leads us to our own death. That's not a great model for us. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the Jewish belief has been over the centuries that we should live for another day that part of our purpose is to make sure that we continue on despite all the persecution and despite all the difficulties we've had over the centuries. So, you know, I like to hike. It's a good hike. And I'm not telling people not to go on the hike in Masada, uh, but I don't think that's the model, the story that we want to be telling ourselves. You say, Shlomo, that the ultimate biblical vision is for the cessation of all warfare and is a goal toward which humanity must aspire. Um, I just, as we end, I would love you to, we sometimes we forget that peace is ultimately 
what we all should be striving for and that there has to be sort of faith that that's actually the goal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's partly a matter of faith that we believe that we're aspiring for this and we believe that this world will come to that place. But it's also something not just a matter of faith, but something that we should be striving for and implementing in the way we behave. And I think one of the reasons why we try to impose limits on the way we fight war is precisely because we're keeping in mind at always this vision of a day when swords will be turned into plowshares, right? Where the Isaiah vision, where we won't be fighting wars anymore. And one of the ways in which we might accomplish that is to uproot evil, of course, and the threats, but also to do in a way which we feel is ethical. And that's a great struggle. But I think that a Jew who believes in our tradition, who believes in Jewish history and our Jewish future, always needs to maintain that ideal in their mind. You have a whole chapter about Rob Cook, and it's so fascinating. So much of this book is just, is it's so readable and it's so fascinating. But I'd just love you to talk about Rob Cook for a moment before we end. Now, Rob Cook's a really fascinating figure, and he lives literally in Europe during World War I. So he sees the horror of warfare, and he sees exactly as a terrible war. Uh, he also, though, has a vision of the restoration of Jewish sovereignty and of nationalism, but a purified nationalism and which will fight, but will also fight ethically and fight in a way which we hope will bring us to a state uh, in which uh, we'll no longer have to fight anymore. And because of that, he raises all sorts of questions about the biblical legacy of how we fought then and asserts very clearly how we fought then isn't necessarily the way we should be fighting today. I think that's a very powerful message because you could say, look at the history of warfare, look at the history of biblical warfare, and you could say, oh, maybe this is the actual Jewish model. And I think his answer is no, right? that's not our model. Our model incorporates many different values, and we can try to implement that in our times. Rav Cook died before the state of Israel's was founded. He dies in 1935. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't get to experience all the dilemmas that we've had. But I think his teaching still remain very powerful. So finally, Dr. Brody, how would you like this book to be used uh, it's, it's again, it's, I think, more urgent than you could have anticipated um, post-October 7th. And I think it could be an incredible learning tool, but also a, a kind of reckoning on our own moral compass right now. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I hope the book is a source of inspiration, inspiration of saying that Judaism is what to teach on this topic, both to ourselves and to the world, but all sorts of inspiration that pushes us to think long and hard about why we fight and how we fight. And uh, my hope and prayer is that when you read these stories, and much of the book is stories of the ways that we've confronted these dilemmas in the past, we'll be inspired by the fact that our leaders of yesteryear thought deeply about these issues, and we can continue to you know, think deeply about these issues today. Uh, I know I certainly have strong feelings about this war, and I hope and pray that the IDF is successful and protecting our people and returning the hostages and restoring security on our borders. Uh, but part of that uh, belief and that part of that prayer is also that the IDF soldiers continue to act in the ways of our values and ethics. I think they're doing that. I think we should take pride in that and continue to support them as they seek that goal. Dr. Shlomo Brody, thank you so much. The book is called Ethics of Our Fighters, A Jewish View on War and Morality. It's been my pleasure to speak to you. I'm Abigail Pogrebin for In the Spotlight. I will see you next time.